church and the light in this community as we're out and about and trying to share what we have with others. Give us the zeal and the enthusiasm to be children of yours. Give us wisdom in the choices we make in, the, in our conversations, in the way we conduct ourselves to those around about us. Help us to be a light. Help us to look around and see the white harvest that is all around us and take advantage. Father, we ask that you will be with us tonight as we try to offer up praises to you through worship, that the things that we do will be done decently and in order, and that our worship will be done in both truth as well as in spirit. We pray through Jesus' name. Amen. Number 708, number 708, do the first and third. <coughs> Walking in sunlight all of my journey, over the mountains, through the big veil, Jesus has said, Praise. 
118. 118. Be the first and fourth of this. Brother Jimmy, have a prayer. And Brother Larry, we bring our lesson. One and four. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord had done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God And, and talk to 
and evangelism is the tool that needs to be turned and turned, used to help them get back into church. Lord, help us be able to do that. Help us as we go forward tonight, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Jimmy talked about evangelism in his prayer. We've got two or three people that's got home Bible studies going on. And we need to continue to pray for the success of those. Uh, that fruit will be, uh, be, be seen in, in their efforts. And it's exciting to see people that care enough about the lost to go out and put forth the effort to get, uh, get around a table somewhere and discuss Scripture with them. Along the way in life, sometimes though, we find ourselves in uh, dealing with doubt. Okay, Chris. We, uh, we had trouble with this this morning. I thought he had it fixed, but uh, uh, apparently, apparently not. But we'll do the best we can. But doubt. There is much... Uh, reason people have doubts, you know, is it wrong to have doubts? Is it wrong to have spiritual doubts? And when those moments come that you wonder if God is really there, and then you run across the idea and it makes you wonder, uh, did, did, is God going to really take care of me like He has promised? Will, will He be there for me? And, and it makes you wonder, is the Bible really correct? And is it okay to have those kind of thoughts? I want to begin by looking at some Old Testament examples of people that displayed moments of doubt. Because you see, I want to suggest to you that we all have those moments. And there's moments of Christianity that we all feel at, like, like we're at the bottom of a, of a rut somewhere. And where is God when I, when I feel like I really need Him? And this is not something new. You go, you go to the Old Testament and you see there's Moses. Moses had those thoughts. In Exodus chapter 4, if you go down to verse number uh, uh, 13 or so, and when God was selecting him to be the leader of the uh, Israelites out of Egypt, Moses balked. He had doubt if he was the right man. He would say, Sin, I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou will send. And this is Moses is saying God sent someone else. I am not the right man. I have doubts that my capabilities will be able to fulfill this task. You go a little further in the book of Judges. There you find Gideon. Gideon, it was similar. Gideon was told by the angel from God to go and fight against the enemies. I want you to listen to what Gideon says. And see if you have not had similar thoughts. Gideon says, chapter 6, verse 13, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all of His miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Have you ever had those times where you went, where is God? Where is He? Gideon was there, what, what about all those miracles our forefathers told us about when they was coming out of the land of Egypt? If God had been with us, then we wouldn't be now being taken captive. We would not be delivered into the hands of the enemy. Where is God? He had doubts. Have you ever been there? Then there's a guy named Asphath. You probably not very familiar with Asphath. He's one of David's chief, chief musicians. Well, he is the one that wrote Psalms 73. And in Psalm 73, beginning in verse number 12, he says these words. Behold, these are the ungodly Who prospered in this world? They increased in riches. 
Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Why? Why do the ungodly and the unrighteous who live around me, why does it seem they prosper? And, and everything they touch turns to gold and I am just struggling along. I have a hard time making ends meet. That's where he's coming from. Why do the ungodly prosper in this world and increase in riches? Doubts. Maybe that's happened to you. And you see some people around you. They don't spend money in contribution. They take that money and they go out and they play with it and do other things. And so we contribute to the Lord and, and sometimes we have a hard time. Over in the New Testament, there's John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he had doubts. He was languishing in prison and wondering if he had gotten the man wrong as being the Messiah. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, the apostles, they doubted that Jesus' resurrection. They, they were surprised when Jesus showed up. It is not their doubts, though, that we, we remember. We have mentioned several people here that have had doubts. When you think about these people, you don't think about their doubts. What you remember is their accomplishments, the things they did in spite of those doubts. They had moments where they, they had those doubts, but in spite of those moments, they continued to do the will of God. And that's what we remember about these people. They persevered. They hung in there. What is doubt? What, what, what are we talking about? Some define doubt as unbelief. But that isn't how we is used in Scripture. See, all these people, these examples we mentioned, they all had faith. They all had a belief. Consider for instance Peter. You remember the story of Peter and how he walked out on the water out in the middle of the storm in, in, in Matthew 14 and following verse 25. But he had enough faith to step out of that boat in the rough and the turbulent waters. Something probably most of us would not have had. I doubt that I would have gotten out of the boat. But he did. But he finally began to sink and and the Lord reached out His hand and helped save him. And when that happened, here's what the Lord said. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? See, he had faith. He had enough faith to get out of the boat, but he had enough faith to, to get him into the water. But his faith was limited. It was too little for the moment in time. And there's ample evidence for him to believe that Jesus would have taken care of him. He had seen the miracles. He had heard the teachings of Jesus. But he didn't have enough faith. And because he had a small amount of faith, he is described as having doubt. Not that he didn't have faith. He just didn't have enough faith. See, doubt. It's not, it's, not having, it's not a lack of faith. What doubt is, is an insufficient amount of faith. And that's where we want to take our thoughts here just a moment. Neither Moses or Gideon doubted in the existence of God. They just doubted that they were the right men to carry out God's will. Asphalt, the musician, he wondered if, it, if the righteous could survive like the unrighteous. He had some doubts. The apostles, they were having trouble accepting the testimony that Jesus was resurrected and, 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 and that He would be there for them. You see this idea of doubt in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, there's a word he uses there called unstable. And that carries the idea of doubt. <clears throat> James would say a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. 
this double, this doubtful wavering is really a sign of immaturity. Notice what Paul writes for us in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 4 this time. And if you start up back up here in verse number 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. That's instability. That's what James would call being unstable. If you toss to and fro, you're carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slide of men and cunning craftiness. Wherefore, they lie in wait to deceive you. But this idea of doubt is an emotional storm. And it interferes with your logical thinking. And it causes you to uh, not reason properly. It's to feel unconvinced. It's to feel uncertain about something that you lack information on. Understanding doubt. Understand that doubt will help to give us some clues on how to handle it. See, the antidote of doubt is faith. It's faith. And the basis of faith is the knowledge of God. Probably most of us in this room are familiar with Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. This is why Jesus would challenge His people to examine Him. There was a time in the ministry of Jesus, He would tell us in John chapter 10. If you run your finger down to verse number 37 and look at verse 38, there Jesus would say, if I do not uh, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe me not, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in Him. The antidote to doubt is faith. Knowing what Jesus teaches Knowing the things that Jesus did. Knowing His message. Knowing the book when troublesome times comes our way. That will help to remove doubt. Come to a conclusion. If you have some doubts about something, don't remain waffling between the two sides. Don't be tossed to and fro. See, there's some people that don't want to make a decision. There are some people that decide as long as they have doubts about the Bible, then they have an excuse for not being obedient. They're always looking for, for another question so that they can uh, remain doubtful. Always learning, but never coming to the truth. See, Paul talked about that, didn't he? Paul writing the young preacher Timothy talks about there's going to be some people that are always learning, always seeking information, but they never learn the truth. They never come to the knowledge of truth. They've always got some question, always some doubt, always something that, that keeps them from being obedient. And we see this idea in the life of Pilate. As Jesus was standing before Pilate just hours before he was nailed to the cross, Jesus was talking to Pilate and, and, he, and he's during the interrogation and he tells Pilate, everyone that is of truth heareth my voice. Everyone that is truth hears my voice. And here's what Pilate said. What is truth? What is truth? And what I want you to notice is the end of that verse. After Pilate asked that question, then it says that he, when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews. Pilate didn't wait for Jesus to give him an answer. Pilate asked a question and then 
He didn't give Jesus the time to say what he might have said in John 17, 17, that thy word is truth. He really wasn't looking for the answer. He went out to the Jews before Jesus could answer because he did not really apparently want to know what truth was. And there are some people today that really don't want to know the truth. They seek knowledge. They gather information to debate. Atheists, a lot of atheists have a, a wealth of knowledge, but they don't ever let it sink in and then take advantage of it as far as being receptive to the truth. They'd rather reject the evidence of truth that's around them. No evidence is good enough for some of those. And you don't have to have all the answers to draw a conclusion. You don't have to know everything. God didn't tell Job why all these problems was happening to him. God doesn't have to explain everything. God didn't tell Abraham why he wanted him to take his son Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. But Abraham had enough trust in God that it trumped any doubt that he may have had. And in fact, Abraham was reasoning. You go over to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11 and 19, it says that Abraham, he, he was accountable to God that God would be able to raise him up from the dead. <clears throat> Abraham somehow understood. This is my only begotten son. God wants me to take his life. I will do that. Because somehow God will be able to bring him back from the dead. Abraham's trust overshadowed his doubts. And that ought to be a good example for us. Considering doubt. Don't abandon what you know. You know, there may be some evolutional things that bring, the evolutionist brings up that might be something you've never thought about. Might challenge your thinking a little bit. But don't let that be reason to conclude that Christianity is wrong. And that God and the religion of Christ is something to be laid aside. Don't let doubt on some particular matter cause you to lose sight of the things that you do know. Understand too, doubt is not always bad. Take for instance, you're studying with someone and they have, a, they have from a different religious background. And in this course of this study, you open up scripture and they read passages from themselves and along the way, they begin to have a little bit of doubt about what they had been taught previously. They begin to have some doubt about their conviction in that case, doubt is a good thing. Doubt is not always bad. <coughs> it can create some questions. Don't lose sight of those things. You know, don't let things or recognize that all doubt is bad. Point number three. One can be confident and still be wrong. You can have all kinds of confidence and still be wrong. Every once in a while you hear while somebody say something along these lines. I am certain beyond a shadow of a doubt. You ever heard that or something like? And people, when they say that, they mean, I am 100% sure it's this the way. See, that's the way Jacob was. Jacob was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that Joseph had been killed. Because of the way Joseph's brothers presented the information to Jacob, he was sure. He moaned, he grieved for years. But he found out that was wrong. Joseph had not been killed. Then you got the Apostle Paul. When he was Saul of Tarsus, he was in full of confidence and just knew this Christianity movement was wrong until he received some new evidence. We run head on with Jesus on that road to Damascus. And you've got it recorded for you in Philippians chapter 3 how this new evidence caused him to doubt his Judaism and where he stood. He was comfortably committed, but that confidence was not right. 
When you make a change based on evidence, that's a good thing. If you make a change based on emotions, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. We want to be people to evaluate the evidence. We look through God's Word. Faith is cultivated. If we see there's things we need to do in His Word, then I would hope and I would trust we would be willing to do those things. Don't act on doubt. Don't make your decisions. That's where Jacob was. That's where Saul was. And both of those men were wrong. When Jesus appeared eight days later to see Thomas, some interesting things took place. Jesus had appeared to the, His apostles after His resurrection, but Thomas was not there. And his apostles, they all tried to tell Thomas, yes, we saw Jesus. We were sure He was resurrected. We, 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 we were there. But it wasn't until eight days later that Jesus appeared again. They were all in a room. Jesus entered into that room without coming through a door. He just appeared. And Thomas was there. In John chapter 20, beginning of verse 26, the text tells us, after eight days, again, His disciples went within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut. He stood in the midst and He said, Peace be unto you. And then it's almost like He turned and looked face to face, eye to eye with Thomas. Then He said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. As far as we know, Thomas never did put his hand in that side of open wound to Jesus. He never touched the holes in his hands. Seeing was enough to convince Thomas. But here's what Jesus says to Thomas. See, sometimes Thomas gets a bad rap. Sometimes he is called doubting Thomas. And they say that in a derogatory way. I think that's a positive thing. See, Thomas was not going to take what other people said as 100% truth. He wanted evidence on his own. And brethren, we need to be that way when it comes to uh, spiritual matters. Frequently I have said, it is dangerous to accept what someone tells you in the name of religion. You need to search it out for yourself. Seek out the truth for yourself. Salvation is too important to accept what someone tells you. And that's where Thomas was. Verse number 29. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. Thomas, he wanted the same evidence that the other apostles had. And he didn't reject the evidence. Once it was presented to him, he accepted it. He was convinced. And as we look at the close of verse 29, that deals with you and it deals with me. The end of verse 29, Thomas was blessed by knowing that Jesus was indeed alive and that Jesus could maintain the testimony that he had made. That word blessed in this verse is the same word that's used over the Beatitudes carries the idea of happy. Today, 
while we're not able to see Jesus, we can be blessed. We can be happy because, see, we too can make such claims that Jesus is alive. Because we have more evidence than Thomas. We have the full revelation given to us by God. Thomas only knew the little bit of things that happened in his world. But we have the complete story. We have all the inspired scriptures that gives us everything we need to know. That's something Thomas did not have. From the completed scriptures, we learn that one needs to obey the gospel to prepare themselves for heaven. One is to obey the gospel in order to become a New Testament Christian. And that leads us to the closing remark for the evening. Have you done that? Have you obeyed the gospel? We talked this morning about Cornelius and the goodness of a man and all the good qualities that Cornelius had. But all those good qualities did not save that man. It took the words of Peter tell him what he needed to do to be saved. The last verse in Acts chapter 10, and Peter commanded them to be baptized. That's part of the, that's the core of the gospel. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Have those sins washed away. Have them eradicated. Let the Lord add you to His church. Acts 2.47 Have you done that? Perhaps you have. And perhaps you have sort of lost sight. You have deviated. You've gotten off the course just a little bit. And you need to come back home. Come back where you belong. Come back and rededicate, refocus. And go to work for the Lord. Seek forgiveness. I don't know where you are spiritually, but if we can assist you in a public way, we invite you to come. As we stand together. And as we say. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. My cross will carry. No tears in heaven.